My name is Corey Hart, and I work for PIC. And PIC stands for Pig Improvement Company. About 55 years ago, in a British tavern, these guys got together and decided that they were going to improve the um, improve the pigs that they got to work with every day. And they knew that they could do better than what they were dealing with at this point. In doing so, starting in the UK, they came over to the United States in a, in a little town called Franklin, Kentucky. This was a really small, um, really, really small area. And but they decided to make some serious genetic improvement and put the time and effort into improving these animals. So um, built a company based on making robust genetic improvement and making an awesome all around animal. And that, there we go. Um, that is how our company is founded. And in the time that we have um, been around in those 55 years, we have grown to be one of the genetic, the largest genetic breeding stock companies in the world. Currently we're based in over 30 different countries and it's really neat that this industry allows you to see that many different aspects of the world. One of the things I was trying to send to Leanne, or Lee, yeah, was <laughs> pictures of different parts of the world and different pigs in different parts. Um, not sure if, I'm going to get it sent or not, but I was working on <laughs> No worries. Actually, it, it there, like we'll see if it'll go and load. Perfect. Okay. So, um, but part of what I have done in my career with this company and in my career with pigs is worked in a wide, wide, wide variety of roles. So, um, Originally, I started out as someone who had never even seen a pig, and I had taken a swine class because I wanted to take the beef class at school, and you needed to take a meat animal class, and well, the swine class was really easy. I, I did well in it, but, and then, you know, they did some cool things with the interview process, and I went for a practice interview for that, and you know what? It sounded fun. So, I mean, right there is, you know, you might not always know what things are in store for you and you should really look at all your possibilities. I ended up going to Oklahoma and working on a very big sow farm. And that was awesome. I got to meet so many different people and work and do so many different things. And I mean, I had never done, well, <laughs> never done tornadoes as much as I did when I was in Oklahoma, but, <laughs> um, I just, it was pretty cool to get to, um, be in that environment where you got to really be, um, someone who got a chance to learn and just absorb things. Sorry. It's not quite so loud. Um, but, um, after I did that, I also got the chance to do some really neat opportunities where I got to work on some projects like getting little piglets to survive, um, doing a what's called a colostrum deprived project. And so, I mean, those kind of projects are really neat because you really get to have that kind of environment where you really get to see a wide variety of aspects. And I mean, you put your heart and soul into it as a producer and you're really trying to help these piglets live, but it's very, very, you know, sometimes it, as a producer, life is very disappointing and incredibly rewarding all in one shot. So um, PIC is not involved themselves but we do have a sister company under the same umbrella and it's ABS. So PIC is under the same umbrella as ABS and they've actually upped their beef program, but of course they're known for more of dairy semen and their sex cell program. So the question was, is PIC only involved in swine genetics or are they involved in the genetics of other species? In case you couldn't um, see the chat. Sorry, Corey. Nope, you're good. 
Yep. Now, and that that's kind of the nice part about us is because with this aspect of our company, that allows our company to have a really good handle on a big part of the agricultural industry. So we can see, you know, um, where things like sex sell were really cool for us because even as pig producers, we're like, wow, wouldn't that be neat someday? It's not realistic at this point, but sex semen is, and the way that it took off and the different, you know, applications for it. And it's, it's great. I mean, and I talked to small dairy producers who just love the sex semen. So, I mean, that's what's kind of cool about being that cross company and cross species. It's not necessarily my daily everyday thing, but you still get to interact with those people and see a different business structure because their world is very, very different than mine. So, um, yeah. Um, but currently my role is a farm manager for a very big farm, very important farm because we, um, there are two genetic nucleus farms for PIC. And with us leading the world in genetics as it is, these two farms drive that genetic engine. And those farms are amazing. It is, that is the most fun thing. Pigs are managed in what's called like, um, I would say that you micromanage pigs. You look at things in a very small number to make improvements. So you watch a lot of numbers, but because of that, you also can see those small improvements as you go. And then sometimes you see big jumps when things like genomics come involved. And all of a sudden you've got pigs that are weighing 10 kilograms more and you're calling the farm saying, something's wrong with our scale because these pigs just got big. So um, that's kind of the really cool part about pig, the pig world is because there are so many things that can be measured and they are measured and it makes it much more fun for um, you on a daily basis to be able to get to see that kind of stuff. Everything from, you know, basic little things like pre wean mortality and you know where you've got those piglets before you wean them and that mortality there that you just you know that's that's your first jump to get those piglets off to a good start and when your pre wean mortality is really hot really low that's really fun but it's hard then as a new management challenge you know you'll go from hey i have too many pigs to hey i have too few pigs all in the same day <laughs> It's amazing because it's not necessarily on the pre-wean itself that you do that, but you can have too few pigs in another part of your production system. And there's, and pigs have a wide variety of production systems. You start off with the farrowing house and those baby pigs. Well, you start in the breeding barn to make those baby pigs. And that's where your genetic improvement gets driven, <clears throat> really driven hard. And the right people making the right choices on matings as a lot of people know on this call that that's very, very important on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, we have the whole genetic engine is started off there, but genetics are only as good as the data that backs them up. So if we don't have accurate weights and that kind of thing, or accurate birth weights, accurate information all the way through is what drives a genetic impro improvement program completely. So data accuracy is crazy important in this role. Um, part of, I mean, and then, and then you get to the animal husbandry part where you get to remember every day, every piglet that comes out of their mom, you are the most important person to that pig even more so than their mom some days because if you get your room too cold with the ventilation you don't give him a chance to even make it so the animal husbandry it's really neat and when people look at these production systems they look at them and say oh they're so big you can't care well i beg to differ there are a lot of people in these farms. We have 20, we have 3,400 sows in our barn. 
there's 18,000 pigs under my roof. And I should say my complex of roofs, but if you have to do what's right for every pig every day, if that means checking to make sure that the feed is proper and the air temperature in the room, the amount of draft, or that their water bowl is working properly, animal husbandry at that level, it still is so important. And you really see it when you're, you know, you've got those pigs that end up being the pigs you spend the most time on, but that's where you make your changes. Your little pigs that just aren't thriving right away. But you know what, if you can clean that up, you know, if you can bring those around, it is so cool to be able to put the extra time and effort into those little pigs and make it, make them, you know, make them at least be a good pig. They may not be the top of the line, but they sure can have a good life. Uh, but in this role, <laughs> it's kind of neat because I've had the chance, like I talked about the colostrum deprived pig program. I've had the chance to work in a lot of different roles within this company and within other companies as well. Um, I have been a boar stud manager where the farm was not the most technical technologically advanced but it gave you the opportunity to understand cell morphology on a sperm cell very accurately because you counted them and you counted the imperfections and the abnormalities so you got to learn how to use the microscopes properly and to look at different motility and thoroughly understand what it means when someone says oh you know, there's lots of sperm cells there, but if they're not all swimming, they're not making progress. So, I mean, I got to do that. And in that you're working with customers, filling orders, uh, delivery routes, all of that sort of stuff. That's really cool. And then delivery route and management is a challenge, but you have some great people usually that you'll find working for you. That makes it a lot easier to a lot more fun. And then I've also gotten to work as far away from pigs as working in selling software. So the pig industry is really broad spectrum. We rely on people like those software developers and software support technicians. I mean, even, and this is going to sound so silly, even someone who is using their smartphone correctly, and they have less, less stress coming into our environments because we do use so much technology. And so someone who knows how to use a cell phone and can really problem solve, it sounds silly to say, but that's great. And that analytical thinking that comes with it sometimes, you know, your those problem solving, that's awesome. So, I mean, we use things like, of course, we use our veterinarians very, very closely. So that's part of our world. And we use our nutritionists, our geneticists. Our geneticists more, they, they build software programs to do most of the work for us. It's, so now it's as easy as make sure you're mating her correctly and that we're giving her the right, what we call an index. And that index takes in all of the relation from everywhere in the world. Like it could be, our database is massive. There's 30 million sows in our database. And so everybody is cross correlated. So when our geneticists just give us a number, well, they just tell us who we can't breed her to and let us do the rest. And then we get to make the right choices. And breeding the best to the best may not always be the correct choice. You may find that breeding the best to the second best may actually make you the better pig with the heterozygous bigger and how they're gonna grow. So that's the software developers are very important. Um, we have guys working for our company right now who have never fundamentally touched a pig and they do software. And so um, there are many, many people that, you know, we have event planners, um, 
we have all kinds that you can be part of the swine industry and still um, not necessarily even do production. I myself prefer production. I like the pigs. Um, we also have our customer service. Did that load, Leanne, or no? Um, working on it. <laughs> it was big. <laughs> um, it, we have our customer service reps that, you know, help out, but you're still part of that production system and they're putting in data and orders and working with the customers. So they're still part of our world that we live in every day. Um, then um, the other part that I got to do was I did a lot of the technical data collection. So ultrasounding pigs for loin depth and back fat and intermuscular fat, learning how to set up equipment. I got to travel to places that were very, very cool ultrasounding for loin depth and back fat and teaching to people what the right leg structure is and how to select the right animals for customer sales. Um, I got to go to China, I, which was awesome. When I was in China, I got to go to three different farms. So I traveled throughout the country as well. Um, that was a two week trip. It was, I was ready to come home. The food was very different but it was so good and worth trying everything, even if you didn't like it. And yeah, they, they even got me raspberry jam and bread and eggs because they were worried their American friend would not eat their food. <laughs> so funny. I love it. Yeah. It was quite humorous. I was like, I don't, but I want to eat yours because I can't at home. <laughs> it's very cool. Yep. And, um, I've made great friends worldwide. In China, I know now that I can call my friend Julie and I have a contact to set me up if I want to go visit somewhere, she'll help me out. So that is one of the greatest things. Um, I also have a lot of great friends in Germany now. I have a good friend in the UK. I went to, I went to Germany, I went to Ireland and I went to Denmark. All of this was before African swine fever hit. <laughs> So it was, it was good because everything, the production looked pretty good. China was so neat, but they have, they have so many disease challenges there that they live in compounds where basically the whole compound is biosecure and you, anything that comes in has to be disinfected. And so you live in a dormitory for two months and then get to leave for like five days and then come back and live. So they feed you and they do everything as far as that goes, but, and they, you know, provide a basketball hoop and some TV and whatever you bring with you, but you still, you live there to take care of the pigs. It was a very different environment <clears throat> than what I was used to. Um, Germany, they get to choose their pig in the U S when you're buying a pig, you're trusting that I'm going to send you a nice pig in Germany. They got to, um, they had to choose their pig according to, they would walk in a room and they would have all the paperwork and numbers on it. And he's behind a glass wall and you actually get to see your pig move around and you say, I want this one, this one, and this one to go on the truck. So it's really neat to see the different cultures as well. Um, they both have a lot, like Germany does very, very well. And Europe has a very different culture than the US and where it's much more, um, don't frustration, they don't do and that sort of stuff. They, uh, and I don't know if they stopped tail docking yet or not but they are scheduled to. So yeah, that, that makes another challenge for production. Um, what do you think these are so neat that you have actually been able to travel to so many cool places, which gives everybody on the call a great idea of just the spectrum that, you know, the opportunities that are provided in the position that you are in. What would you say like, a day in your typical field, like tomorrow, what is a typical day going to look like for what you do? 
So tomorrow, <laughs> don't get scared. I'm gonna get up at four o'clock in the morning. Well, I'll get up at 3.15 and I'll be at the farm by four. And I am going to prep a sales load to go to a customer in North Dakota. So I'm gonna review some animals, make sure they have good feet and legs before I send them up to this customer. And then after that, we're going to chore and treat not a large number of animals. We're going to do some, some washing, some, um, some day one processing where the newborn piglets get identification. Um, there's gonna be breeding happening. All of these things are done in different departments on my farm because we are so large. Um, we have very, very cut and dried lines that people are very specialized in. And being someone who is great at getting, making great reproductive numbers happen or um, getting piglets to live or, you know, managing that farrowing house, those kind of things are still something that, um, like we have what we call our technical service teams that go out and help customers. And their day-to-day -day is helping customers. So our farm is very, um, very big and taking care of the animals is the number one priority. And, you know, tomorrow we're loading a sales truck. I have one week where we're gonna send out a thousand head of sales animals in that one week. Yeah, it's, it's crazy busy, but, and we loaded, well, I loaded a semi of animals going to slaughter this morning to be harvested. And, you know, those are a byproduct that we have and we still need to hit a core market weight and a target market weight. So it, we have to be selective about how we load those trucks. Very cool. So there's really no off season in your particular career field. It's all the time. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I think it's going to slow down. We'll get an order in for um, a thousand head of animals and we can have, the other thing is we have nine different lines on our farm. So that makes it a little more stimulating as far as, you know, I can have someone say, well, I want this from, I want six of this line from one birth lot, 10 of this line from one birth lot. And then from a different birth lot, I want six of this line and two of that line. So we've got lots of really changing dynamic things. Very cool. Lisa asked a great question. What is your educational background and how did you decide the swine industry was for you? Well, the swine industry was completely by accident. I was sure I was supposed to be a horse person. <laughs> but once, once we got started in it, it was, it definitely, I mean, having that, I don't know, it's, it's between measuring and the change and the genetic improvement and the fast pace that really it, you don't get bored or you don't get slow. And, and yes, our litter size has gone up every quarter even. I mean, we've had people call up and like when I send out what we call our, one of our reports, we send it out and it's so fun to put together because when I get to look at our numbers and see how we're improving, that's awesome. But yeah, the swine industry is just so dynamic and so fast paced because between the short gestation length and the number of piglets produced, it really moves fast in a various number of ways. I've been there 10 years at, well, 11 years now at this complex, and we've seen different lines change in body structure and type and had some different genetic influences that we had to weed back out some of it. We've had to make some leg structure changes and we're all in control of that. And that's what's really, really cool is the being able to, you know, go out there and look at an animal and be like, Ooh, I don't want her back, back in my herd, but this guilt is awesome. And then you hope she has a great pedigree as well. That's really cool. Is there um, a requirement, like let's say we were put an out, application out for your position tomorrow, would there be a requirement for a bachelor's degree or how would that kind of look? I do have an animal science bachelor's degree, but there is absolutely not. Um, the requirement is the ability to learn, the willingness to learn, a very open mind, um, and just being able to grasp concepts and move on, you know, and Animal, there is so many different facets within the swine industry because you have your farm managers, which are much more intense, of course. And then you have people that make great pig care people 
that really thoroughly enjoy the day to day and taking care of the animals and their heart and soul is in that. And that's what brings them some real happiness in their life. So, and then you have your people that turn into those people that are specialists that want to travel to different farms and, you know, helping other farms be successful is what drives them. Um, a bachelor's of science, we go to colleges and we recruit. So, but we recruit anybody that wants to give it a try, honestly, at a farm, at a college. We're not going to say, oh, you have a history degree and we're not going to let you come. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. really cool. So you guys probably do on-farm training. So like you're saying, you might not have any experience with hogs. You might not have even touched a hog of any sort and you will take them and train them. Some of my best people, myself included, had no experience when we started pig farming. That's really and cool. It was definitely an attention to detail and um, it's that drive that want to and that desire to just be better about how you're handling everything. So I love some of the things that you've already listed. So attention to detail, ability to learn, open-minded. What are some other life skills that you might think of or any sort of potential um, characteristics that you would look for in a good employee? Dedication. Um, That is definitely really important when it comes to the swine industry or to you know, to farming in general, I would hope that, you know, that's kind of, this is 4-H and that's, that's a pretty big deal. Um, but you definitely get a different level of dedication, um, open-mindedness, willing to try hard. And there's going to be days where you're going to be tired, but they're also going to be offset by days that the day wasn't quite as hard and you had something really fulfilling happening. And those days that you're tired, you might be tired because it was a huge day and a huge success. And it was a culmination of a huge project, but you know, that steadfastness and not willing to give up and willingness to just persevere is what will make things be more fulfilling for each person. That's really cool. I like that a lot. Um, You talked a little bit about some of your passions already in your career and just working with the animals. Um, What would you say is your favorite part of the job? Oh boy. (laughs) Well, so as a farm manager, I have a lot of different aspects. Um, I have, not only do I have the chance to take care of the animals, but I also have a chance to work with people and fulfill people. So training people and watching people grow is one of the aspects that you don't think of when you think of pig farming. But being able to train people, watching them fulfill themselves, seeing potential in people, and then watching people crawl towards it and want to get better, having faith in people. I mean, I have some really, I have some really cool success stories that are under our roof and they're very neat. And working with people is one of the best things about my job that I get to do every day. Oh my gosh. I love hearing that. In fact, that actually brings me to another question. So oftentimes I have 4-Hers that have a passion in something, but they're like, oh, I can never do that. I I think I would fail at it. So can you give me an example of a time where, you know, maybe you failed and something really successful has come out of it just to kind of motivate some of those kids that would think, ah, pigs, I love pigs, but I can never do it because I think I would fail. So... I'm not a production person. Like I'm a farm manager of a farm that impacts globally the genetic influences of every pig in the world at some extent, somewhere, probably. I mean, it's just, it's just going to happen just by the way that the dissemination and I'm not someone that had a big perform a production background. I had no idea. So two years ago, I took this role and was absolutely terrified. And I turned it down the first time because I thought that I couldn't do it. And um, I have earned the respect of people as high as I can go in my company. And I had earned that respect a little bit prior to that, but I definitely have not lost any of it. And our farm is working at one of the highest levels it has worked at in 10, 11 years. And that's how long it's been around. So I mean, there are definitely times where you have to mentally grab yourself and pull yourself back in and just put your nose to the grindstone and start 
taking a, you know, eat that elephant one bite at a time. That's good. I love it. That's very inspirational. Thanks for sharing that. So kind of along that same lines, you kind of mentioned that maybe you're going to have to get up early for your, your position. You might have some long days and some stressful days. Are there any other big challenges in your career that you would highlight to give some kids just some ideas? Um, well, it's production agriculture and part of our world, you know, the best part of our world is when it's going to be 32 degrees outside or 32 below outside and it's going to be 50 mile an hour winds, cold, miserable, and I'm going to be in my 65 degree barn. So that's the challenge on the opposite side of it. But at the same time, I'm going to be working in that barn in the summer when it's 75 and sunny. So, (laughs) and that can be hard, but that's part of, you go to work early, you're done early. So you go enjoy the day in the afternoon a lot of times. That's really cool. I like that. Uh, What would you say somebody interested in your position, what would be an expected salary range or potential benefits or package perks that would come with a position like yours? Um, originally this position came with, and it does for a lot of farm managers, there'll be a house on the farm that you can take advantage of. I already had my place. So I have someone that stays there instead. So that can be part of your package. Um, a lot of times you'll get a pickup and that kind of thing, because I'm often running errands for the farm and doing extra things specifically for the farm. So a pickup is part of my package. Um, And I have heard, I'm trying to think of some of the top end salaries, and there's usually a bonus incentive in most of them, but I'm guessing you can go anywhere depending on what your farm is from like around 65 to 110,000. So I've heard some very, some very lucrative packages that are out there. And I've got a few different contacts that work with different production systems and styles. And there's always stuff like the bonus incentives are different with every corporation and things like that. So I don't, I can't make a great estimate because of those, but yeah, that's kind of a rough range. But it, it's really neat because it sounds like there's so much opportunity. Not only you've, you've mentioned, you know, your position, you've mentioned, like you said, that um, there's a broad spectrum of potential careers just at your facility. And so it's kind of neat to hear you talk about the engagement and the opportunities that really surround what you're doing. So let's say you're in your position. It sounds like there is opportunity to go up again, if you, if you so desire. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. I I have opportunity to, um, well, I have a boss and he's, you know, he has a boss, so we could go there, but we're still building another farm right now in Canada. So there is going to be opportunity for advancement either, and I'm going to run to Canada, but we're going to have to change some of our structure. So that kind of thing is going to happen. And do you have any internship opportunities at your farm? Yep. After anyone is 16 years of age, they can work for us. Um, we do do internships all summer long. Um, but you know, we've had some people that have, we've had numerous very successful internships. I currently have a girl right now working for me who was an intern. Um, we had a guy, um, oh no, he was not an intern, but I have another gal that she is an intern <clears throat> or was an intern for like three years. She was fairly local and then came back and she went on to go to our, our farm in Canada. And then now they're working for another customer farm as well. So, I mean, our internship program works well. I try to not overwhelm people so that they feel like they're grasping something really well instead of, I mean, my farm has a lot of different cogs and pieces. So I want them to feel like they aren't just like, oh, I can't, it was so blur. I don't even know what I learned. Mm-hmm. Cool. For sure. I love that. And do, is it a paid internship? Do they get housing? Is there anything that they, you guys provide? Yep. We do. Currently we do housing and then we pay as well. Perfect. I like that. Uh, so I have to ask everybody this question because I think it's a really important question for um, our 4-Hers to hear. What are your thoughts on first impressions? <laughs> um. 
you may find this funny, but as I walk with someone, I will make my impression on how they keep up with me and how they walk. Uh Aha, interesting. Um, I have had most of my first impression. I've had a couple of first impressions where I got burnt, but I definitely is the speed in someone's stride that I can make a lot of assumptions off of that. Hmm. Very cool. That's uh, good to know. I will take note of that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I love it. Um, Is there anything that you would leave our... um, our 4 H'ers and those listening, which I actually am going to launch a poll here just because I'm curious who is actually on our call. So if you um, see something pop up across the screen, if you can answer that for me just quickly, just to see where you guys are coming from. And if we got 4 H'ers or parents and guardians joining us, just select that for us just so we know. Um, but do you have any other advice or wisdom that you would give those that are on the call or those that'll be watching this later um, to motivate them or excite them for your type of career field? Um, I think looking at the possibilities and not like, don't be closed minded about anything because you just don't know what's out there and how things can, can, ascend or migrate or how they're going to change. Um, You know, don't be afraid to take a leap. And if you fail, you learn something. So I, you know, you might, you may have learned that this isn't my favorite thing in the world, but you may also have learned that you are great at something you never thought you'd be good at. I love that. That's so good. Thank you so much for sharing that. Is there anybody on the call that has any sort of questions that you would like to open up and ask Corey? Give them (laughs) a minute. Some of them might be shy. And if you want to even privately send it to me in the chat box, you certainly can, or Lisa, or or you can send it to Rick either way. I see that there is a question about what do I look for in their stride? Can they keep up with me? (laughs) (laughs) I have a tendency to walk fast. And the irony is that when the people from this farm go other places, like we travel together sometimes for meetings and stuff, and we all walk really fast (laughs) because we have lots to do and we're very motivated and very driven. And I remember when I was in college, so it wasn't like a big deal to me, but I used to run, like I'd get out the door of my apartment and run to my car. I could walk, but I always ran and I'm not a runner. Like I don't like to run, but 50 feet, I'll do it. So, I mean, it's just, that's usually it's, are they, you know, are they hesitant or are they coming with us and they're, you know, building their assuredness as they come. I like that. That's cool. It it makes sense if there was somebody that was kind of slow and dragging their feet, um, you know, how motivated and what kind of passion would they be to take that kind of directive to follow you. Yep. Very cool. I like that question. Thank you so much for asking it. Is there any other questions that uh, might come from somebody on this call? Well, I certainly appreciate, I'm sorry we didn't get your pictures loaded. Um, I still haven't seen anything come through. Um, oh, but, that's a bummer, but if you hey, want, Corey, they'll share it. Oh, go ahead, Lisa. I was just going to ask, I know Corey a little bit. And so I know you're not from this area, just as I'm not from this area. Was it really hard to move to a place where you didn't know somebody or did you look at that as an adventure? That's one of the things I hear from our college students all the time is that they don't want to move any further than a hundred miles from home because they don't know anybody. Um. That was tough. It was very, um, it was very, very challenging. I mean, I moved to Oklahoma and I didn't know anyone. Um, I knew the lady that I'd called down there to put my horse at her farm. My best friend was working three hours away. Um, um, So she was there, you know, she was riding horses for somebody, but I knew nobody on my farm or nothing nobody it was very unnerving at first but I think you just need to 
look for something that you're interested in. So through my horse, I got to meet a few other people. I made friends with the people at work um, and they were great friends and I really miss them. They're, I have lost touch with some of those people, but I have kept contact with lots of other people. So through this role, I've lived places like I lived Oklahoma. Then I moved to Kentucky where I knew a couple of people from work and that was it. And then I moved out to South Dakota here recently. And um, it was, I mean, there's been lots of different moving and I just look for something that I'm interested in and try to find somebody else that's interested in somewhat of the same thing. I spent some time at the sale barn when I got here and found, made some great friends really fast. That's really cool. Thanks for asking that, Lisa. Uh, we have a good, a great question um, from Vivian. It says that you said you, um, you said there were some folks in your organization who had a hard time. Can you share a bit about someone who overcame a challenge? Um, I think sometimes you need to, um, I'm trying to think. I have a few people, not a few people, probably one who just had to internally overcome a challenge and learn to learn to grow himself. And he is getting stronger and stronger and more, um, I'm trying to come up with the right, more confident in his role every day. And I have some people that you never would have thought that they have gotten to the place they are and they are doing amazing, really great. And um, so they might, and like this, the one individual probably doesn't see it as a challenge, but he is so steadfast and doesn't back down and really, you know, really tries to problem solve and come up with solutions. And it's just great that steadfastness. And, you know, I am always willing to work with someone and send, spend some quality time with anything they need. And, you know, we're willing to help people and provide any tools that we can, as long as people are willing to learn as well. That is so good, Corey. I totally didn't miss your question, Ryan. Sorry about that. Um, thank you for answering that. Ryan was asking, what do you plan in your future, like a next role? And what is your 10 year plan? Um, that's kind of a, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> I have, <laughs> well, I really enjoy people and working with people and I kind of have a dream job that I would like to do. And we're in the middle of building. Um, we have some workers from Mexico right now, and we're in the middle of building um, this tap, this workforce. And it would be great to be able to see this become a um, kind of a launching pad for bringing people in, getting them acclimatized, helping them with their English, thoroughly getting them taught where, you know, helping them learn and then, you know, springboarding them on. And so in 10 years, I probably wouldn't be still doing that. I would look for more of a overseeing production role by that point. Um, there's, there's so many open doors. And I found that over the last years that I never would have been able to predict where I am now. So it's really hard for me to be able to predict that, but that would be a really fun role for me to have. That's really cool. I love that. Uh, Daniel was asking, how complicated is the initial breeding process and how long does it take to breed two good pigs? As far as like the actual mating itself or? Um, I'm guessing, yeah. Okay, so we do what we call post-cervical artificial insemination. So what we have is we have a foam tip catheter that we insert into the sow's cervix and then, or gild. And then after that, there is a little, um, what I, inner cannula, which you insert further. Then you are in the uterus. So you're able to deposit the semen very quickly. All of our sows are, all of our animals are bred through artificial insemination. So we're able to take those really great boars and spread them all the way around the world, which we do. We send, you know, 
we could be sending some to, um, I think we were sending Germany, we were sending some to for a while and there's different exports that we do. That's really so the breeding process is really fast and the gestation link is 115 days. So it's quite quick. That is really cool. So it could take as little as, well, technically, I guess you said you're gaining data. So within that 150 days, you probably have to gain some data once the farrowing process happens to see what is a good pig. Yep. So our animals will be about 160 to 180 days once they are full mature animals, as far as they are either going to be decided to come back into our herd or they're going to be harvested. Okay. And even when we send them to harvest, we're still collecting data as far as um, like growth data and loin data and actual carcass data. That's really cool. That makes sense. All right. We have another incredible question here. To what do you attribute gaining confidence? How do you help them get stronger or discover their talents or strengths? Um. Oh, you just got on mute. Sorry. <laughs> is their strength as far as um, finding what makes them, them, and it sounds, don't take this wrong, feel good. Because what makes them start to want to make that crawl and make and get stronger about what they're doing. And, you know, and you start to, you need to watch and you need to pay attention to people and you know, you need to not take advantage of some things as far as like, you know, this person really takes pride in doing this. Don't take that away from them because someone else can do it too, mm -hmm. as well as they can do it almost as well. So that's the kind of, I mean, I think gaining that personal relationship where you can help them find their strengths and, you know, kind of cater to them. And that is definitely a key part in gaining confidence for people. That's really cool. I like that. What other questions do you guys have? These are great questions, guys. Nice work. Corey, to take a different side to Daniel's question, how long does it take generally when you all identify uh, lines of pigs that you potentially want to mate to get to your ideal pig? Not, <laughs> not in terms of three months, three weeks, three days, but yeah. um, is that a three-year process? What you know, we'd think about it in cattle and it's hugely long. And I know it's got to be shorter in pigs or I'd think it would be. Well, one of the big things, I mean, and cattle, you're not, I mean, you're measuring some wean weights and yearling weights. And that is, I mean, it is long process and slow. And you just don't get the progeny, the vast amount of progeny data quickly. Yeah, um, and the generation interval is really long. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's brutal. But um, so you've got your 180 days that will give you a really good idea of what that animal's doing. And as far as what that 180 after, you know, days old. So you still got, you know, you got your 115 days that they're gestating 21 day, you know, and then there are 180 days before they make a mature animal. You'll start to see some things that one of the pictures that I had was the most exciting day that I ever had was when I had 170 kilo off test guilt and I was so excited, but her progeny weren't there so you know it's we kept her and we bred her and we thought we had this wonderful pig and her progeny didn't didn't come back into the herd and they didn't have good leg structure and so I mean it's hard to put a hard you know we don't have an ideal pig for one yet <laughs> never stop improving is our motto so um we really you know that's our drive is to do that and, you know, it, I would say that you've got that 115 days plus 180, I'd say you've got, and then it depends if you're looking at maternal versus terminal lines, you know, your maternal lines, you're not going to see if she's fulfilled until she's going to start having litters and weaning pigs. And that's going to be, you know, so you're talking a year or so at least. Thank you, Lisa, for putting that um, kilogram to pound conversion in there. <laughs> It's okay. <laughs> My world lives there. Yeah. I love it. 
That's very good. I love that. I love your guys' motto. Um, I feel like that speaks not only to your career in terms of uh, what you're providing, but as individuals in, in itself. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and we really are people driven and, you know, we want to enrich people and it's a great company to work for in that respect as well. It You really allow you're, the sky's the limit. It's just what you want to put into it. That's really cool. I love it. Any other great questions out there? Remember, there's no such thing as a bad question. So we'd love to hear any questions that you have. Well, and if you still want to send me those pictures, I can um, probably still incorporate them into the, um, the presentation too, so. Corey, what does self-care look like for you? You know, I know that we're moving into a new generation of people that maybe doesn't love to work 80 hours a week and do it every day. What, what do you do to take care of yourself and refresh yourself? Well, that's where, you know, I try to spend some, some days it's, you know, sitting down for two hours and watching a movie and shutting the phone off. Um, taking advantage of when we don't have blizzards and enjoying just to be able to, even in the middle of winter, which, you know, I'm into horses, so I have a lot of time spent outside and being able to make some progress with my animals at home is really a big chunk of that. Um, those are, that's for me, something that's very fulfilling is that I'm fulfilling my hopes and goals at home with my horses as well. So, I'm not really, you know, down and out, but in the wintertime when it's cold, sitting down and watching a movie is great. But in the summertime, it could be riding five heads of horses on a day off. Like <laughs> it's kind of a weird, weird double standard. <laughs> I love that so much. Um, I also am a horse girl, so I feel you. Um, I am going to, for, while you guys are still on the call, um, put up our next um, participants that are going to be joining us. So it looks like uh, November 11th, if you're looking at your screen, um, we'll have uh, an ag reporter and fit jockey. That'll be Will. And then on the 12th, so these are both this week, uh, and uh, is um, from IX Ranch. It's a huge ranch in Montana. So um, definitely connect with us on Facebook and you can find uh, all of our links to register and all that stuff uh, via Facebook. Um, if, you're, if you're having trouble finding it, you can always reach out to me, my uh, emails on that um, as well. Boy, I can't tell you how much I'm so grateful for your time tonight, Corey. It's been fun not only hearing about your position and I can sense you have such a passion for what you do. So it's really fun to even see that and feel that from the screen. Um, and it's exciting that I hope that reaches the people that view this video as well, because I think that's such a key factor in any position is having that passion shine and um, it really delivers uh, into your tangible objects that you're working with. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your story tonight and being with us. I, it's very, very much appreciated. You are very welcome. All right. Well, if thank we you, don't have, Corey. yeah, thank you. And thank you. Lisa. Thanks for having me. Seriously. That's cool. Lisa, uh, yeah, Lisa's the one that reached out and, and suggested um, you join us. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes. So pretty exciting. So thank you, Lisa, for um, connecting with Corey and getting her on our call. With that, I hope that everybody has a fantastic day. And, and if for some reason you have a, a question that you just are burning and you think of it later, reach out to me and I'm sure I can connect with Corey and, and get that answered. So um, thank you guys again, and I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. Join us for all the rest of the calls. There's going to be some good ones, too. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Corey. Mm -hmm.